It's great to see you too, man. I am joined here by the author of the Dark Shadows Day book, Patrick McCray, man. We're here to discuss Dark Shadows time travel, man. Let's do it. <laughs> so, really, the first time traveler is Barnabas, right? I mean, he's going forward in the future, laying in that chain coffin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is definitely a form of time travel. Um, you know, you just stay in the same place for a long time. But yeah, it is. Barnabas is the spam of uh, of time travelers, you know, because with spam, it's cooked in the can. Right. And I don't mean in, in the bathroom. Um, I mean that it's 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 cooked in the can, and uh, and if it's not perforated, if the can is not perforated, spam will stay faithless forever. That's a scientific fact. What were your thoughts on seeing this guy come, the hand come out of the coffin, him grabbing Willie? Willie accidentally has discovered the secret room. Sure. I mean, he's a total stranger in the '60s. He's never, you know, he's from 1795. Yeah. He doesn't really. I find it interesting. He doesn't react to the future. He doesn't like react to. He does a good job not selling that he's a stranger. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, you gotta remember, he's, he's kind of psychic. Right. So, you know, he's able to read minds and, and all of that, and um, I assume that his first night in Collinsport is him doing more mind draining than blood draining. You know, that's why it's just, I think, what's an owl who are dead or something like that. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know what knowledge of the future he got from cattle, right. but um, clearly it was enough. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, like yeah. that. I like the fact that he he, he tells Willie, you, you, have, you have a job to do. <laughs> he has to go and, to. Yeah, and, and, you know, and the thing is, Yes, he beats Willie relentlessly, <laughs> but you've got to remember that back then they had very different views on what was human and what wasn't, and they had a very clear class structure, and, uh, you know, a servant like that was kind of a home appliance, and, you know, as in the old days when the appliance wasn't working, he kind of smacked it on the side and it would start working again. And I, I, as inhuman as Barnabas's treatment towards Willie is, at the same time, it's completely in character. Yep. It, it somehow doesn't remove Barnabas from being a very forward-thinking, hip, humane, liberal guy, which for 1795 he was. I think it's, I, I'm your boss and you're my employee and you need to listen to me, man. <laughs> well... But Willie would stop betraying him at every turn right. and it, making decisions that, that will result in his death, I think Barnabas probably would have talked dental plan. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, this doesn't come up. You know, he would have gotten some shares in, in Collins Shipbuilding, and which, you know, needless to say, neither of them know no longer exists. But, uh, uh, you know... What are you gonna do? Willie's not getting that employee of the month card ever, I don't think. <laughs> well, he is, but just by virtue of the fact that there are no other employees. Right. You right. know. Right. I like, I like that. What were your thoughts on there instead you know, Dark Shadows did not use time machines. Everything I think when you see watch movies. Oh well oh, I I what about the time staircase? I don't consider that a machine. Okay. In my opinion, I don't like when I think of that Kate that staircase that Quentin built. I think it was more of a piece of the house. Okay. And it once have been they, an empty portal. Right, right. It once it's connected to the once he, it's part of that house. Remember, this house has already introduced parallel time, so who's to say? Yeah. Who's to say there isn't a staircase or wasn't a staircase constructed to go to time? Well, okay, so this is very interesting because uh, Clinton and Desmond construct the staircase. We know yep. that. Yep. And it, I kind of, the, and then they discovered parallel time. Right. I have a lot of, I've thought a lot about the parallel time room and 
kind of what that what that means and I, how close is it to the to the playroom and to the lab? I think it's it's is it in the same wing? Yeah, I would say so. I think but, it is. So I kind of wonder if the room became a kind of weird energy purge valve yeah. for all of the time travel that was going on and that this rip between the dimensions uh, was a result of that staircase existing. That's interesting. I never like really thought of it that way. How, now, how did you think? I just think when Quentin built it, when he built this staircase, the house, I don't know, there's always something about Collinwood itself. That, the, yes. that old house itself. I mean, this house has had, it has ghosts. So, I, I was always waiting for the whole house to go back, like to disappear. <laughs> like in, yeah. In the series. And I know that might sound strange, but it's Dark Shadows. So. Well, it's not strange when you consider that Joshua is an agent of the Leviathans. <laughs> sure. Okay, so uh, uh, hear me out. Because right. Joshua does something very weird. Right. Um, he uh, he builds a giant house for a family of five yeah. when he has a giant house for a family yeah, of five. five. Yeah. Why do you do that? Well, what if the Leviathan altar is not the only uh, Leviathan thing? What if the Leviathan altar is simply uh, a satellite or a signal of something much larger right. that that potentially is under the earth and and what if Collinwood itself was built as almost a, a cathedral an energy chamber for what the Leviathans had going on and uh, and and all to await Jeb I mean and Joshua might not have even done it intentionally. It might have been an accident. But um, that's a that's a thing to consider. I think you sort of mentioned this in your book as well, where Joshua, it's strange that Joshua builds a giant house when he already has a giant house. He has a house. Right. Yeah. Who does that? So, I mean, it is, you're right. I'm sorry. It, in Dubai, you know, they don't right. do things that extravagant. No, it's it is strange because the, it's not like there's anything wrong with the old house. So no, there isn't. And and, and how long has it been there? I, you know, maybe a no. hundred years, yeah. maybe. Right. Uh, because Josh, okay, so Joshua is the maybe the grandson of Isaac. Yep. If Isaac was around in 1790, and, and let's say Isaac was. 25 in 1790, right? right? So, and let's say he had a son late. Let's say he had a son when he was 50. Right. Okay. So, that's uh, 1715. And then what would be, okay, so 1715 plus, uh, let's say, generously 30 is what? 1745? Uh, so if Joshua was born, let's say born 1745, then he would be, the, he, he very well could be the grandson of Isaac. And so even if Isaac built the house, right. the house isn't that old. It's, it's less than 100 years old. And a house of that quality back then was meant to be dynastic. You would think... So God did this. Right. You would think, too... I mean, they know they're living in this state that receives heavy weather. So they built those houses for that weather. So I don't think there's a... Not, yeah, not just heavy weather. They had, uh, you know, uh, people who were already living there who right. were thrilled with them living there. Um, they had the Dutch yeah. that they had to worry about. They had the Spanish, they had the French, they had, you know, all, all kinds of pirates and weirdos. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, those houses are fortresses. Yeah. Why does the old house have all of those cells down there, you know? Right. They don't like to protect. That's something I was pointing out to my wife when we saw a picture of a castle. She goes, look, at why would they build it like that? I said, that they didn't build it for luxury. They built it for defense. 
So in many ways, you could look at Colin, the original old house, as a defense house or a fort or once was. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a statement, in fact, of how comfortable they could become that they put the sitting rooms, the social rooms, so close to the entrance. Right. Because you know those houses are massive, and I'm sure they have you know layers of safety built in it's almost as if those rooms are decoys and thing too in the in the one of the cells there's an escape there's an escape route that the family would have known about absolutely you know so i think your point is very valid because when you look at it from a wholesale from a wholesale standpoint they yeah. they were they didn't build this house for just luxury they built it because they had to deal with all this other stuff the wars and stuff and the weather no. Yeah. So. Yeah. What were your thoughts on Vicky? They use they do it a, a séance, and she yeah. she gets hurled back to 1795, all the way. Boy, that's a lot to unpack. What do you think? I think Victoria Winters, and I'm going to use a wrestling term because I'm a wrestling nut, is the biggest baby face in Dark Shadows to this point. And I, sure. I, I, Vicky is my favorite character, and I love Alexander Isles. But I honestly think they're using Vicky because she's the biggest baby face to put Barnabas over as a baby face. You mean the writers? Yes, they're putting. Okay. They're sure. using. Well, she's also the main character, right? So you know you have to have something for her to do, and she and she, and she starts out. I mean, if we're looking at this from a writing point of view, she starts out as the audience surrogate. Yep. So she's going to continue to be the audience surrogate there. Yep. She she's your storyteller. She they're using her to get you there, to get mm-hmm. you to 1795. They're not mm-hmm. necessarily. I don't feel they're necessarily just telling the story through her. They're telling the story through the people who lived it: Barnabas, Angelique, Joshua, Naomi, Sarah, all yeah. of, all of them. That's how I view 1795. Yeah, um, from a storytelling point of view, absolutely. But now we must geek out and 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 ask, okay, yeah, but what's actually going in the story in the in the in the Dark Shadows universe? If we pretend that it's uh, that it's that it's real for a moment, um, yeah, the documentary. Um, if if we pretend that it's real for a moment, the the big question becomes, uh, what on earth? Why did this happen? Right. Uh, is it Sarah? Right. Who who did this? And if it was Sarah, was it to warn Vicky not necessarily about Barnabas, but about Angelique? Right. That Angelique's going to show back up. Uh, and then why, you know, why Vicky? Um, um, maybe because she was a stranger. I, I don't know. I think Vicky, if. My theory is who brought her back, like because uh-huh. Sarah is the one trying to like get him to do the seance. Yeah, but I think honestly, in many ways, it's many figures. It's Sarah. It's Josette's ghost, and Phyllis Wick is the unfortunate soul <laughs> who gets. Her, now her story is different than Vicky because she she was there until the moment Barnabas's coffin got taken to the mausoleum, so. That's where Vicky's story really differs with her. Vicky wasn't there until that point. She was in jail by the, before Barnabas died. So yeah. I think there's a lot of things. I think it's Sarah's ghost, Josette's ghost, and just time is a bewildered, pardon the French, bitch. It just... Yeah. <laughs> just... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, it's it's a lot to take in. I My, my ultimate... I like I'm, I'm a big fan of Occam's Razor, and so I, I like to try and narrow things down. M- you know, maybe m- maybe Sarah's ghost because I gotta wonder what is Josette's. I don't know if Josette's ghost is mentally in a state right. to uh, to do that. I mean, you know, she's she's good at coming out of the wall and terrifying Matthew Morgan, and and stuff like that. But but you know, she died so traumatically. That you know, even uh, even you know, old Sarah's death of tuberculosis or something, 
is uh, which I guess is what it was or the flu or something like that yeah. is, is chicken scratch um, or there is some even larger force that that we don't necessarily know that leads me to my 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 unified field theory of Judas Zachary yeah. and that it's it's Judas Zachary's mission to destabilize the family uh, not slowly because he does have a big finish yeah. uh, in mind yeah. but um, but he wants to demoralize them you know generation after generation after generation but he also knows that Wenton's going to be showing up and that Barnabas is going to be showing up these are inevitabilities um, and that you know whatever he can do to destabilize that situation and cause as much chaos in the house as possible, he'll do. Because this leads into my theory about Quentin, yeah. and that it's not Quentin in the room. It was never Quentin's ghost. It was never Quentin in the room. Yeah. Judas actually is very good at appearing to be other things and possessing things, and that that it was Judas actually all along. Which, if you go with that theory, explains so much. I see what you're saying, that Judah Zachary himself is manifesting himself as Quentin's ghost. Is manifesting Yeah, him. because you know, he's going to be showing up, right. and it's going to be a terrible press release for right. him. Right. When he, because they all kind of remember Quentin's ghost, yeah. but Quentin's running around. And so if it really were a change in the timeline, right. uh, in theory, they would all have forgotten. But the only real change in the timeline like that that happens is after 1840, when he's killed. Right, right. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, I'm just. I. Well, I like I like what you're saying because here too with that, Quentin, when you look when you think about Quentin and Beth's talking about the ghost of Beth, it lets you know that Judas Zachary has that kind of power. He can even fool the un, the undead, you know, the ghosts, the spirits. Oh, it, indeed. Or he can impersonate the ghost of Beth. Yep. And feed Julia this line of, of, of horse pucky. Yep. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in, in an essay that uh, uh, I was really, I was so happy with that it infuriated some fans. I wasn't happy that it infuriated some fans. I was I was happy and it infuriated some fans, uh, but it, it delighted many more. So uh, anyway, um, but that that is Beth a reliable narrator? Right. You know, or is she lying, or is it even Beth? Right. It's it's a interesting like theory. I love that because it leads dark shadows is a world of possibilities, mm -hmm. and they're never really ending. You know what I mean? It's something sure. your day book even talks about that th this is a world that's full of possibilities. And mm -hmm. so I have to ask you, do you feel that and it, it sort of tells this in the day book too. So do you feel that Judah Zachary was just behind the whole Bryn Victoria, Lord Barnabas into 1897? <laughs> it, it certainly is a, a a marvelous tool of psychological torture. Right. You know, to just continually build these people up yep. and then knock them down. And build them up and knock them down. And, you know, uh, you see that happen with Vicky. Yep. You see, because I see she's not happier when she gets back from the 1790s at all. She's, she's miserable. <laughs> uh, you know, and then she just goes back in time yep. and you know, goes out west to get collar or something, you know, yeah. I mean, got, my God, does she know how horrible life is going to be out there, out, out, it's terrible. But anyway, you know, the, the thing with trying to chart Barnabas's moral journey is, because that's to me what the show's really a lot about, is that he gets built up, yep. and then he gets brought down, built up, brought down, built up, brought down. In your book, in the book, you, you talk about Barnabas willing himself back in time. And I love what you said about he's he's had enough <laughs> that he's he's he burn he has Matthew or he has uh, Ben and him burn Angelique. <laughs> yeah, there there comes a certain point 
And, of course, in real life, it's when the writers needed to move on to another story. But I, but I, I choose to ignore that. I, I much prefer it's those moments when Barnabas, you know, he's had, he's, he's wrung his hands. Barnabas loves to, he and the skipper yep. love to hold their hands up like this and wring them. And, uh, and you know, he gets talked out of killing people all the time by Julia and Willie. And, uh, and, and you know, when he tries to play the game, He's he's so slick with uh, with how he deals with Laura, you know. Thanks to Angelique, you know, who becomes kind of his Mrs. Peel, like in the Avengers. Uh, and um, and yet, when Barnabas is really pissed off, well, fire is a great. He's really fond of fire. Torch the torch the, the the Todd's antique shop. That'll that'll show him. Angelique, oh, you said you were gonna save Vicky's life and you wouldn't. Well, uh, well, here, here we go. You know, <laughs> right. old school patriarchy has a way of dealing with these things. Yes, it does. <laughs> this, this is what we do. We, this is this is how we ended up ruling the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, we burn entire civil, or rather, we have our staff burn entire civilizations <laughs> before breakfast. Yeah. And we don't shed a tear. We chuckle as if we were reading Nancy and Sluggo. Uh, over over breakfast, as we talk about, you know, the various indigenous cultures that we've completely decimated, and uh, and so you think we're going to be sentimental about you? <laughs> oh, Angelique, we've just been we've been humoring you this entire time. Right, it, like the Roman Empire, that's sort of what you know they would do. Like, and that's sort of what you know when you look at you our bet. our ancestors, it's like. Well, the Collins is they 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 they're descended from the descendants of the descendants of the you know all those gladiators, and they they didn't they didn't put up with that garbage. So why? Not, not after a certain point, right? You know, I think it's I think it's when I talk about Barnabas actually being a real liberal guy for his period. I think the fact that he put up with it at oh. all. You think Joshua would have put up with any of that? Had he been the one with the affair with the island girl and so on and so forth, he would have burned the house down and laughed if he had known Angelique <coughs> was inside. That's sort of why I said about Solomon Cain, because Solomon Cain wouldn't put up with any of it. If he had a door, if he had a revolver, <laughs> he he'd have just be like, "Bang, you're done." Right. If Joshua had been younger, right, or if Jeremiah had been allowed to stick around, yep. and Trask had shown up, yep. Uh, Trask would have met some stairs. Yes. yes. Trask would have Trask would have had a horrible, horrible fall down some stairs at the inn, and uh, you know instead of Barnabas having to both transform into a bat and somehow elevate a dead prostitute in his teeth and fly as a bat into into the room and carry the cane, but he pulled it off. Yes, he did. And that's what a level-headed, mellow man he really was. He, he's setting you up for the murder of a prostitute. It's all good now. <laughs> right? That's, that's, for, for the Collinses of that era, that's the humane approach. It is. That's so crazy. Right. That's the, that's the open-minded, liberal, humane, Alan Alda sort of approach. Hey, killing you would be easy. <laughs> right? Death would sure. be, death would be a reward at this point. Sure. I'm going to set you up for murder now. <laughs> <laughs> that being nice, right? That's right? just that's just them being nice. That's a warning shot. It is. I like that. That's a warning. And uh, you know, and now, Mr. Trask, you're going to uh, you're going to be named Mr. Insulation uh, <laughs> for the uh, for the inside of the walls, and uh, and a stinky insulation you shall be. But I'm going to be locked up in a coffin several miles away. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you you being in my wall, I don't care. <laughs> Right? That's what it is. Right? It's, it's true. I love that, Patrick. That is great, man. What did mm -hmm. What did you think about them taking the I Ching wands and uh -huh. just the hexagram of change? I always think about Doc Brown's line in uh, Back to the Future. Once, once the speed armor hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. Once the yeah. once the eighteen wands show the hexagram of change, you're gonna see some serious shit. Yeah. <laughs> Stop you. 
Yeah, you know, if, if you are a vampire, if you are meditating, if you have a body waiting for you, or you're Julia Hoffman, yeah. one or the other, and uh, who just does it. She's so tough, she doesn't even need a body back there. Right. She's like, you know, F you MFers, I'm just going to go back. <laughs> Take that. You know, whenever anybody wants to talk crap about Julia, I just think, you people are out of your minds. She's so tough, she doesn't even need a dead body to go into when she travels through time. She just freaking does it. She, really, she does what Barnabas does without a body, you're right. Like, because Barnabas yeah. has a body to go back to in 1796. But with Julia, she don't got no body in 1897. She's like, you know what, screw it, I'm going back. I'm going it's back. That's right. She, you know, and there's every reason to, to believe, you know, we don't get Julia's exact age. Right. Um, I, I always imagined that she uh, was in, you know, like Women's Air Corps or something like that in World War II, uh, as very young, you know, you know, eighteen, nineteen, and uh, and that she was she was uh, she was a she was a medical officer in Korea. I I imagine Julia is one 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 stone cold badass bitch. Yep. And I say that with the utmost respect. She she. She was a Bond girl who didn't need a gun. You know what I mean? She was bad. I agree with you. She was total badass. Yeah. Uh, Grayson Hall is so underrated, right? <laughs> not, not, not in these parts. Right. No, not in between. Hall is the best. Right. Grace, you know, st to hell with Steve Rogers, she got the super soldier serum. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. She, she, she's just ready to do whatever it takes. I mean, she'll clock her parallel self over the head. Oh, isn't that a great moment? Gosh, I just, I, I laugh with delight every time, every time that happens. Uh, it's, uh, she, she's, she's marvelous. But, you know, back to, back to the I Ching ones. I think it was a, it was a, it was a really inventive time travel move. And it, and it began to pull in other cultures into the occult, you know, life of Dark Shadow, and it, it honestly, it sets up a lot of stuff for Peter Zachary, yep. who is found, his head is found in Asia. Yep. Uh, you know, what would have happened if you had attached the hand to the neck of Judah Zachary, oh, and it no. would have been like Think, you know, crawling around with this head on the end of it, the most powerful, the most powerful force in the universe. Do you think in a weird way, Judah was tr maybe trying to get to 18, 1897 to get the hand of a tofe. I would love it if it were true. Oh, and I right. think future historians will prove it. Right. How how wickedly awesome would that have been? Right? It'd be great. Right. It'd, be, it'd be great. Right. I, I mean, we talked about Darth Vader, but Judah Zachary having the hand of a tofe would have been badassery that's your what if right that's, that's your what if right it's, yeah. it's one of the biggest maybe what if moments I gotta ask you something real quick well sure. not real quick Naomi Collins Joshua yeah. what? I have a fan theory I wanna okay. run past so we know the legend about the, the jewels that a pirate gave her these jewels yeah I have a theory that a pirate didn't give her the jewels. That okay. She was the pirate and stole them. Oh, I love that. I love that. That she stole them. Uh huh. And then just made up the legend. Sure. Sure. Why? Uh, you know, add in the fact that she wore the jeweled mask. Right. Yep. That was the thing that she uh, that disguised her. That's why everyone thought it was, uh, you know, Black Scarlet or whatever the, the the pirate would have been, the Crimson Reprimand or. Whoever she called herself. Right. I like that. Yeah. And she was listening in. She knew all of the shipping stuff because she was listening in on what Joshua was doing. Yeah. And then, you know, she'd say, oh, I got to go have another baby. I'll be back in a few months. <laughs> and, uh, you know, would just do horrible things. I like that. I just, that's fantastic. I like that, man. Um, what did you say? So they used the E chain we were talking about, but, and we talked about Patefe and. So what were your thoughts on parallel time? Is that more of Judah Zachary in your mind? Well, parallel time, 
you know, okay, so we have to we have to we have to discern what we're talking about. Are we talking about from the point of view of the writers? Are we talking about from from within the actual story? Um, we'll go within the actual story. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, parallel time. I really see as this. Um, it either could be an invention of Judah Zachary's, to just to you know, it's a it's a torture for Barnabas to give him a little bit of hope and knock him down, um, and uh, and it's it also I do think is maybe a venting process of all of this time travel that it's it's this um, side effect of having the the. The thing that did in the in the basement, you know, the, the staircase, right. and so on. Um, uh, that to me is the thing that makes the most sense because, um, you know, it also has powers of time travel, and uh, and and so on. So it, it it just makes sense that the fibers, almost the mycelia of the of the of the staircase have inhabited this room uh, and you know there there's no saying that the room might have been some other kind of um, invention that Quentin and Desmond worked on later yeah. you know just because once you have a disruption in time it works in both directions yeah. so Quentin and Desmond you know it's like they say okay we won't do any more time travel Professor Stokes, you know, we got that. But dimensional travel, aha, where there's going to be a better world, that's something else. But what happens, of course, is that you can imagine then the room is like uh, a stone in a pond, and it's sent out ripples in both directions. So Quentin and Desmond are seeing the parallel time room before they have invented it. Right. Because it's sending these shock waves out in both directions. In many ways, Dark Shadows is the inventor of the multiverse, right? I mean, you got to give them that. It's it, you know, it really, really, really is. Oh, I, well, I mean, had DC DC had come up with Earth Two by then, I think. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I want to credit Dark Shadows with this. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Uh, you know, but I, I. I think maybe DC beat them to it, um, and it's it's funny, you know. I wonder how much of an influence comic books had on the writing staff for one reason: Matthew Hall, because Matthew Hall strikes me as the sort of kid who would have had comic books around, yeah. and that Sam, a prodigious reader. Probably picked him up every once in a while, you know, when he was headed to the can or whatnot. And, uh, yeah, because there's a lot of Marvel that shows, like real Marvel, right. uh, that shows up in, uh, in Dark Shadows, in, in its sensibilities. And, and there's, some, there's even some DC that shows up in there. And where did it come from? I mean, I don't think mean, Gordon Russell was, you know, picking up the latest copy of Flash. Right. But I think Matthew... Right. Probably had a big stack of them. I think the one thing we talked about when Barnabas wills himself back. It's funny. Yeah. There's a movie with Christopher Reeve. Later on, he does. Somewhere in time. Yep, some more time. He does the same thing. And to me, that's taken from DS. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, when did Bid Time Return? When was that written? I'm going to look that up. Because that's the novel that Matheson. Uh, uh, wrote and let's see when did Dick Matheson in 1975. So and and Dark Shadows seems like the sort of show that Richard Matheson would have been aware of. <laughs> uh, you know I have a I have a fantasy I, I have my own parallel time. Oh, really? Um, sure, my own vision of it where sure. uh, Dark Shadows moves to uh, the production of it moves to Burbank. In, in the early 70s and that somebody like Richard Matheson or David Gerald becomes the, the showrunner of it yeah. and it continues and wow. what would that have been like? 
That's neat. I never thought of that that way. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, most of the soaps, right. you know, all the soaps went to Los Angeles eventually. Right. Yep. You know. They used to be on the East, but a lot of, you're right, most of them now all, all went out west. All, all went out to L.A., all went out to the West. They filmed several days ahead of time. They had editing. I mean, not that Dark Shadows didn't, but it wasn't the whole live on tape thing. With with Dark Shadows, if they if they approve this new series, how do you want them? To, do you want them to use soundstage sets? No, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Privately, do I? Yes. Okay. But I think anything they do that is too stylized is going to be just like the director who screwed up the 2004 pilot. Okay. with all the saturated red lighting right. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, people, uh, they, this, the situation I'm about to cite is less now than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, people who appear hip often like to rip on dark shadows. Mm. And people to appear hip like the rip on dark shadows specifically production values and the way it looks and i think dark shadows cannot afford to be anything other than absolutely pristine in how it presents itself i yeah. think the moment it tries to wink at the audience and do anything stylized you're dead yeah um you, you know you're you're absolutely dead in the water uh, and and that's a problem. Now, should they do a bunch of location filming? No. I mean, everything shot on a soundstage at some point, but, right. uh, uh, you, know, you know, going out to New York and all of that. No, I, you know, I think, you know, Dark Shadow Fort's best, and, you know, Collins Fort seemingly has a population of, I guess, several thousand, but we only see at most. Ten of them at a time, and that's only when we go to the blue whale. Right, right. I think the most, like the most we see, really is in the beginning episodes where we see the blue whale, <laughs> and there's a bunch of people. I was the assistant to the guy that Carolyn is dancing with in one of those first episodes. Uh, I think his character was also named Buzz or something like that, but it wasn't Buzz Hackett. Right. It's actor Alan Feinstein. Oh, wow. Who's the one in the short sleeve striped shirt who's clapping yeah. and doing that when Carolyn's doing her initial dance? That is. Yeah, it's assistant. That is awesome, man. I didn't know yeah, that. He's a cool guy. That is cool. He had, he had good memories of uh, of the show. Yeah. What's, what's your favorite memory from Dark Shadows? Like, the whole series? Are, are we talking about. Uh, you got you got you could really narrow that okay. down. <laughs> okay. It, that could be a lot of things. Okay, so I will, uh, so maybe not one memory. What's something when you look at Dark Shadows? What's for you, you personally? What's something you go, man? That's what I remember most. <sighs> well, uh, obviously the hand coming out of the coffin. Right. Um. The. The, the most emotionally cathartic moments are uh, when there's one in particular. There's one in particular. And it, when Barnabas smashes the equipment that Nicholas is using to, to bring Eve back, back to life, yeah. that moment so clearly defines him as being someone who's going to yeah he's a good guy but he's going to use any means necessary to him absolutely deciding absolutely not uh, you know the line must be drawn here no further it's it's Picard with the board and and we finally see his metal tested and he does the right thing and uh that that moment for me, that moment 
and a moment near it when Stokes goes into the green first and F's up Angelique World. <laughs> I like that. Because because here's the thing, in Dark Shadows you always have these uh, occult know-it-alls right. who do nothing but lord their power over humans. Right. And the main tool they use against humans is humans' ignorance of the occult. Right. And finally, just through a character with no special powers, right. simply knowing stuff, yep. he games Randy's his way right into that green, and he simply refuses to have any part of it. And the, his pride in that is so just, it's not pride. It's what Isaac Asimov called fearful self-appreciation. Um, that moment still, those two moments of great Jewish moments. I love those moments. I love Professor Stokes. Like the, to me, that is Thayer David's my favorite character. I love Amazing. I love Patofi, don't get me wrong. He's a great heel. But the moment I love most is when they're doing the seance with Chris and Carolyn and them. And Chris interrupts the sounds, and he just gets right in his face. And like, I mean, I'm curious as why you did that. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, Stokes is taking absolutely no crap. Right. And and isn't it beautiful? Haven't we just been waiting for someone to say, right. I know what's going on. Right. Yeah. We've been waiting for someone to kick in the door, and here comes the guy ready to kick. Who's kicking it in? And it's yeah. beautiful to watch. It's not. It's not like. It's not an annoyance. It's just. Thank. It's like you want to say thank you to the character. And Stokes knows exactly who he is and yep. what he can do and what he has earned, and yet it builds up to a moment of absolute oh shit defeat. Yep. And it's when he tries to exercise the ghost of Quinn. Yep. Everything has led up to that. Stokes thinks he's done it. No, Stokes is absolutely no match. Yep. And he suddenly realizes it, and he has proper humility. Yep. Do you think Stokes ever theorized that maybe it wasn't the ghost of Quentin at all? Uh, maybe. Right. You know, we never really get to hear him right. say anything about that one way or the other. I don't think Stokes has any reason to not believe it's the ghost of right Quentin. i think if Stokes hadn't been called off to egypt or wherever when the judah zachary thing went down with the gerard styles ghost well that would that story would have gone very differently yeah i like when barnabas asked for the medallion for prote protection from a witch room he goes i'll give i'll give you the medallion if you show me the witch <laughs> like yes yes yeah. Throw me the idol, I'll throw you the whip. <laughs> right. right. And talk about somebody who would play a great Professor Stokes, Alfred Molina. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think he would be perfect. He would be perfect. Yeah. I, I think that would be a great... I like... If they ever did Young Elizabeth, and I know she's not British, but Lisa Vicari. They, I don't know who she is. She's a German actress, and... Uh -huh. I'll send you a picture of her in this like dress. She looks like Joan Bennett. She just, cool. I like. I'll send it to you on Twitter, but I'm like, oh my god, she could be Elizabeth, you know, a young Elizabeth. But that's great. So she looks amazing. But I, I agree with you. Alfred Molina would be a great like Professor Stokes, or even or, the Count Pato. Like he could be Pato. Well, like, he would have to have the same actor play both. Right, right, right. That has to be a conceit of the new Dark Shadow series. Yeah. You, you have to keep the ensemble. Is there a new actor you want to see? Maybe if they pick up this new new series. See, as what? As anything, like maybe appear in the series. Oh, if I had to cast the series now, um, yeah, I think um, I I think uh, Kelsey Grammer would make a wonderful Roger. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, uh, oh, actually, you know, see, all the actors are like too old, kind of, but I think Gary Cole would make a very good Barnabas. I think he'd make an exceptional Barnabas. 
Um, I, uh, I, I know that with somebody like Julia Hoffman, uh, Mary McDonald, yeah. I think would be really good. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you would get that, but right. yeah, those are, those are some people who come to mind immediately that I would, I would contact. And I, I think it's, it's really important that the, the women on the show, uh, uh, have a, a, a proper sense of backbone. Right. I think that's the, my, my great disappointment in the 1991 series was right up front. And it's when uh, David, I think, reveals a spider. Maybe it's like a tarantula or something in a box. Yeah. There's a dead rat at one point, but I think maybe he tried to scare the spider or something. And had I written that, he would have very calmly discussed the genus and species and all of these other scientific things about Dave, uh, about, about the whatever thing that David was using to scare And then she just would have looked up and said, David, knowledge is power. Right. I like the. Here's the one thing I'll, I'll give the 04 unaired pilot. When the, oh yeah, she's much tougher. Right, the blonde Victoria when she when he's like drowning himself and then yes. jumps up, she's like. I read the file. I know. I'll I'll let that off with a warning. But next time I'm going to your dad. I loved it. I loved yeah. when she said that. I was like, holy shit! <laughs> like you know. But I'm I'm with you. She was she was tougher there. But in the '91 revival, they don't. It felt like there was that missing piece of women toughness. It's, well, um, you, you know, the '91 revival we've got to remember was invented by and, and really run by a man who was of another era who had spent all of the 1980s you know restaging world war ii yeah. and wanted to capture lightning in a bottle but i i don't know how many horror movies and, and how much pop culture he had really had the time to spend time exploring and inundating himself with. And so there are elements of it that feel, on one hand, uh, that feel very dated, inappropriately dated. Yeah. And then there are the elements of the show that are just pulling a muscle to be contemporary. All of the Maggie sleeping with Roger and uh, that stupid hat that Roger has. I, I won't forgive him for that. You know the hat I'm talking about, too. Um, that stupid hat that he has. <laughs> but it's all of Maggie's, uh, you know, neo pagan, Christian mystic, uh, white light, new age nonsense. Um, that felt like they were going, see, see, we're relevant. See, see, and it's But I don't know. No, no, no. I felt that like the conversation between Maggie and Vic and Vicky when she's saying about David, and she senses that David's mother, you know, I felt there should have been more of that too. Like there should, you know what I mean? Like she should be confronting Roger about not just David but his ex-wife. Like where's that? Where's that confrontation at? Well, I'll tell you. There, there I, I do give the writers a pass okay. because they only have so much time. Right. You know, we, we sit back and we and we, we do think, gosh, why didn't they do this or why didn't they have that moment? You got to right. ask, go, hey, what are you going to cut out? Right. Right. What are you going to cut out? It, it does. It, you're right. Because when you get into to the time of a show, and again, they only had one, they only got one season. And I've always I, I did a video about what if Dark Shadows Revival got a season two? What would what would we have seen? And mm -hmm. what I what I put would be well the Phoenix, you know, because I do feel yeah. even though she's only mentioned once, like as a witch, I feel that's enough of a seed to sort of bring her in. It's a small seed, but it's a seed. It's a seed they plant, you know. Whether mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Well, here's the deal. I agree. 
and with television, because you only have so much time, right. you have got to sit there and say, okay, we're going to do this, yeah. but this means time we take away from Angelique. Yeah. It means time we take away from Quentin. This means, you know, and are we certain this is going to be such a ratings blockbuster that people will go, Quentin who? Angelique who? Nicholas who? And that's the, that, that literally is the multi-million dollar question. I have a question for you. I don't know if you'll know it or not. Did they did they did they have Quentin in mind for the revival at all? I have heard two stories. Okay. I heard two stories. Um one involved Bob Denver. Okay. But I just made that up. Uh uh no, I I've heard two stories. One was that David Selby was going to come back as Quentin. Okay. And the the story I Heard, and I swear to Diablos, I cannot recall where I heard this, um, but uh, the story I heard is that he was maybe the only member of the cast right. of the original show to be as bad. Um, and I, I don't know if that's true. I sure as hell don't want it to be true. Right, right. Um, uh, especially now that I am older. Right. than those cast members were from the original series when they made the Dark Shadows remake. So I really feel that. Um, <laughs> the other story I heard is that it was going to be Adrian Paul. Right. They were going to bring him back as, as Quentin. I, I've always given my input on this. If they could not have gotten Selby, because I could mm -hmm. understand Selby maybe being like, you know, them not wanting to bring anyone else back and just him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I could see him maybe going, well, wait, why just me? Why not everyone else? You yeah. know? So I suggested Rowdy Roddy Piper because... Be right. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that. Because yeah. nobody... I think it's one of my favorite movies. No, no one screamed Wild Child like the Hot Rod. Yeah. You know? so, and Quentin was the ultimate wild child as a male. In many ways, yeah. so, but I w I do wish they would have gotten maybe David to you know come in in the revival, if they could have you know, it's, it's always a what if you know with Dark Shadows what if they did this what if but I love it regardless and I know you do too. Yeah, yeah. My complaint, my beef, yeah, is that why were Catherine or Laura not given the opportunity, maybe they were, but I don't think they're given the opportunity to read for Dr. Crushley. Yeah. What's up with that? What's up with that? I I got I got a bigger beef. Why okay. why is why was not Laura Parker put in the movie The Wicked Witches of Eastwick? Why wasn't Laura Parker Um <laughs> I will I will tell you. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I won't. I won't tell you why. I have no idea. Right, right. Um, very, very, very few things really burn me, right. and are as exemplary of the uh, the short sightedness of Hollywood, yeah. and just the weird nature of casting, and the fact that there are just a ton of actors out there. Yeah, you know. But but you put all those things together. And uh, the, the saddest and most infuriating elements of Dark Shadows for me uh, have to do with the fact that this is a brilliant, literally Mensa-level brilliant ensemble of actors. Yeah. And, um, and any time I watch a movie from the 70s or 80s, I keep, I just keep rushing through my head, wow. What if this had been Nancy Wow, what if this had been Catherine? Wow, what if this had been Laura? Uh, they're so good. Yeah. And they're so charming. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I certainly do give thought to the idea of Star Wars yeah. with uh, Catherine as Princess Leia. Yeah. Wow, that would be great. <laughs> now, of course, she was, well, what the hell? She was living in, in England at the time. Right. George Lucas. <laughs> take, take that. Yeah, 
fast car driving monomyth peddling genius. <laughs> I love that. If Joseph Pant said something about Catherine Lee Scott, you would have put her in Star Wars. Yeah. So get Joseph Campbell on the line. <laughs> Who's got Bill Moyer's number? Pat Patrick, I love your passion, man. It's awesome, man. I love you, too. You are awesome, dude. What, and here's the thing, too. Laura Parker, the one, they talked about Hocus Pocus, too. I want her in that movie. I want her in that movie somehow. Well, you know, one thing Wallace suggested uh, for both Catherine and Laura, um, three words, American Horror Story. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out you to know. Wallace McBride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and you know, I mean, I I I don't know a ton. I mean, I I know that you know there is such a thing as retirement, right, and right. you know, I get the idea that you know we're just kind of in semi-retirement, and and that's what people do. You know, right. we have we, we get so used to to watching them, you know, eternally. You know, in, in their in their twenties or early thirties or, or whatnot, and and we forget that just like you want to retire, show business is a job, yeah. and that at a certain point everybody wants to retire, and that's fair. Yeah. Do you think Laura will come out with another Dark Shadows book? I don't know. Yeah. I hope. So. I hope so too. I've, I hope so. I've read I, two. I've read two of them. I've read Eris, and I've read the Salem. The Salem Branch, and I love mm -hmm. them both. So no, the other two are great. Okay. Um, the uh, you know those, those she's a she's a marvelous writer, and those books are very draining. Uh, I remember her saying something when she she was writing Harris of Collingwood about how nice it was to not have to type the name Barnabas over and over again because it was so easy to misspell. <laughs> and it is. Barabbas <laughs> is it is it, but boobity bop is you know who. It's it's such a sticky combination of letters. Uh, I um, uh, you know, yes, yeah, so of course I hope to write more novels. Yep. Just as much. I hope that uh, Tor, I guess Tor is the company that publishes those. Uh, the the Tor, God bless them. Yep. I don't want to nuke myself with this, but I'll have to point it out. Uh. I hope that Tor has gotten enough of a good glimpse of the inside of its own colon that it can now withdraw its head, look around, and see that they have a wonderful book franchise that, that you know, if Laura wants to write another book, let's just write another book, Laura. But if other people would like to write a book... Yep. Do it. Uh, that, 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 that that chance exists the way it's been given to Star Trek and so many other genres. And I know that the whole publishing situation with that's really complicated because there was another franchise book. There was Dreams of the Darkest Night by, by Mark Rainey that was a great book. And, yeah. and he had another one ready to go. Yeah. And um, and for some reason, they are terrified or God knows what to go further with that. I mean, Hermes Press has shamed them by putting out uh, the Marilyn Ross book again right. in prestige format, proving there's an audience for them. Yep. Well, why not give us something new? new. Yep. Uh, I can tell you an anthology book I would like to see right now, and that's everything that happened to Count Potofi's hand yep. in between when it got cut off and when it gets reattached. Yeah, and they sort of... Oh, they sort of no, I agree. They hint to the, they hint of that in 1897 when he says about having a unicorn, and he loses the hand because he doesn't want to be a werewolf because he killed his unicorn. Okay, yeah. after he loses the hand, does it just what happens with him? What does well, he he's do? Searching for it, so right. clearly it's gone from owner to owner, and it doesn't take owners very long to figure it out. Look at Tim Shaw. Right. Yep. You know, he yep. at least waved it over his wardrobe. Yep. I, I think that would be really interesting to tell that story of what happened to him, like Potofi's whole origin, like be told as a book would be awesome. Yeah. And really, it, he did, 
you've talked about this too before in our past video when Patofi has powers even without the hand. He, oh yeah. He just wants the hand. He just he just wants the hand for an insurance. It's his. It's his. Well, I think the hand certainly increases his powers. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. One thousand <laughs> percent. Is there anything you want to add? I'm out of questions, man. Uh, not right now. Have me back, and we'll talk about more. <laughs> I, I I talk about dark shadows till the cows come home. I'll meet you. First of all, thank you, thank you so much for giving me. Oh, the pleasure time. is mine. I'm I'm having a blast with this. Thank I, you so much, and thank you for the readings. Uh, I enjoy them every time. What a labor of love. I'm actually gonna listen. I am enjoying the hell out of this, and I was listening. Where are, where are you in the book right now? I know I, you're you're like thirteen episodes in, right? Thirteen. 14 I will show you right where I'm. Nineteen seventy parallel time. Okay. That's where I'm gonna start off tomorrow night. I will read tomorrow night that 1970 parallel time what are your what are your thoughts on it so far i mean what like what are you enjoying what could be better what could we do in a subsequent volume what would you like to see what i had i know you got i heard was listening to you guys talk about uh listening to tara at collinwood and you guys are doing maybe yeah. doing a part two to this what yeah. i'm hoping is i want to hear more of you guys' theories of certain things like i know you'd like put them in here too but are there things you didn't put in here you know what I mean? As a fan, from one yeah. fan to two others. I know that sounds weird. But no, like, that's very complimentary. But yeah. I love hearing fan theories. Like, what are you and Wallace's theories on Dark Shadows? I owe all of that, all of my ability to theorize, uh, and my, my, my feeling that there's permission to do it, to a wonderful writer and artist named Warren Odson. I think that's his name, you know, Warren Hudson. Uh, when I read the 1840 Concordance, which, you know, let me tell you, 1840 was the Holy Grail for a long time because that's where the syndication packages tended to stop. Oh, wow. Was, was getting through, you, you'd be about midway through 1970 parallel time. And at the time I worked for a PBS affiliate that was carrying Dark Shadows and stuff, the story was... And again, these are all pre-internet rumors. Uh, but the pre-internet rumor was that it, World Vision wanted a king's ransom wow. for the rest of the series. I think their theory, if this is true, my theory is that their theory was that they would build up such a desire for the rest of the series that then they could all keep it hostage. And I was like, now we, we, we did the vampire thing, and now you know we're looking at Cyrus Longworth. And it's, yeah, we, we've had our dark shadows, guys. Thank you. Um, but uh, Warren Onsen had contributed some essays to the 1840 Concordance, which I found at a Dark Shadows convention cool. and, um, in 89 and bought. And uh, it was such a revelation. And he had, he had an essay about Angelique and Angelique's timeline. And if you get a chance to read it, it is freaking brilliant. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. That that's kind of part of my origin story. Was just reading that. Wow. Yeah. You you guys have done great due diligence. You and Wallace for Dark Shadows, and I applaud that because I'm a huge fan. I mean, but we love it. We really do. Me too. Man, I love yeah. Dark Shadows to death. Yeah. I love talking about it with you with you, and I love Brendan Mark uh, Gilman on. He's a friend of mine, um, but. I love just bringing fans on and talking to them because Dark Shadows is something that I hope everybody watches. You know, give it, give it a shot, right? <laughs> they, you know, I, I really, I've noticed this again and again. If you get someone to watch just, you know, three or four episodes of Dark Shadows, they're going to roll their eyes and, and that's going to be it. If somehow you can get them to watch about 10. Right. They're hooked. Yeah. They're hooked. I actually have a friend of mine, Daniel Culver. He's going through the series on Tubi. He goes, okay. And he's actually go, almost to Barnabas. He's ha he's almost done with the Phoenix arc. Oh, man. He's doing the... He's doing the... Right. The Appalachian Trail of Dark Shadows. Yes. Wow. Yes. Boy, he's a trooper. Yes. He's going to be like a Marine by the time we get to Nicholas Blair. <laughs> yes. Jeez. I got to give 
I give him, he goes, hey, I'm watching Dark Shadows. He goes, I'm really enjoying it. I'm like, great. Great. Oh, you're, if you're enjoying it now. Right. Holy Christ, have you got something to look forward to. Buckle your seatbelt, my friend. Yeah. You're in for a ride. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, and yeah, it, I envy him. And it's a wow. beautiful ride, right? It's it's amazing. Well, keep me updated on that. Yes, I will. I'm going to send you that picture of that actress, but Patrick, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate my, it. Hey, anytime. My time is yours. I, and, and the work that you're doing, is terrific and the way that you're getting people excited the comments i read online about what you've been doing even before the the day book stuff is uh it really 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 has me jazz i'm so so thrilled with what you're doing thank you thank you guys both for you know this this is a masterpiece i can't wait for part two i'm excited so i'm not i'm gonna finish this and <laughs> read more tomorrow night but thank you guys so much thank you Our patrick pleasure. It is a truly honor to have you on, I and mean, you have a great night. You too, sir. Take Good care. Day. You too. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. That was Patrick McRae um, from the Dark, from the Collinsport Historical Society. I hope you guys. Okay. Have a great night, and see ya.